Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Maxwell's House is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Maxwell's House with Ray Maxwell, episode 55 for January 15th, 2010. 3D Tech. It's time for Maxwell's House, the show that covers whatever is in the mind of Maxwell. Ray Maxwell is a Canadian-based uh, raconteur, scientist, color scientist, pilot, glider pilot, photographer, Photoshop wizard, ham radio operator. In fact, if there's so what is that that Ray hasn't? Are you a good cook too, Ray? Yeah, it's just so so. Okay, barbecue. good. Finally, we found something <laughs> Ray can't do. Well, barbecue. I'm sure he's an expert on that too. Hey, Ray Maxwell, how are you today? I'm doing great, Leo. You've just got a great. you've got a subject for today. Yes, indeed. I'm very excited about. In fact. While this is an audio podcast and it's uh, you, you can listen, we're also going to put a version of this up on YouTube uh, so that people can see because there is a lot to be seen in this subject. What are we talking about today? We're going to be talking about the technology behind uh, 3D or stereoscopic vision, binocular vision of human beings, the technology behind that in theaters. So this is so when you went to see Avatar, for instance, or Up. Yep. If you saw it in three D, I saw it in three D, and that triggered my research into this area. And the digger, uh, the the digger, the deeper I dug, the more interesting it got. <laughs> the digger I deeped, the yep. more I found. Good. I'm very interested. And you know, I have to say that we're just back, as you know, from the Consumer Electronics Show, and the the the, the story of the show, one of one of a couple, but one of the, one of the biggest stories of the show was three D television. Yes. And uh, I, I was not a fan. Uh, you have to wear glasses, et cetera. And one of the things I looked for is anybody who had an idea of how to do this without glasses. And the funny thing is, there isn't. Mm -hmm. But So we're going to find out why right. <laughs> and, and how they do it. And is this related to 3D TV or is this really only how it's done in the movie theater? I think they're related. I want to do, before I say anything about the television i want more time to research it okay because uh uh now to be fair if you have a projection television system uh real d already has an industrial strength projection system that uh you know could be installed in a home if you're rich enough <laughs> okay but, uh, and yeah. i have to say there was uh, we saw the toshiba 3d i mean i saw all of them but in the Toshiba 3D, the glasses were prominently labeled Real D. Right. I don't know uh, if, what that means, but they were actually, ironically, they were labeled Real D, but they needed batteries. They were active. So now I'm really confused. <laughs> oh, that, 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 yeah, that doesn't add up. It with, might have uh, been a Real D ad, frankly, that was, yeah. you know, that they paid for on the side. Right. Anyway, but let's talk, we'll talk about, let's talk about movies. Yeah. Now we're going to need go to meeting. Ah, uh, yes. I'll launch Go to Meeting. We use Go to Meeting on the show uh, so that Ray can control his own uh, screenshots. Um, and that works that works quite well, I have to say. Uh, let me just because uh, what I have today is I have I, I have a bunch of slides that uh, are from a talk uh, given uh, uh, by uh, Matt Cowan of uh, Real D. Uh, but we're not going to just talk about Real D. I'm going to talk about all the 3D methods and compare them. And uh, but uh, I, I'll let the cat out of the bag. I think in theaters, there's very good reason why Real D is likely going to be the winner in that area. And as I, we go I, along, I'm, I'm think, very curious to hear this because I talked a day before yesterday with a special effects supervisor for Avatar. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that I saw it in Real D, and he said, yeah, the most of the theaters are doing it in Real D. He said, my preference is Dolby 3D. Yeah. And he said, uh, and I said, what about IMAX? He said, no, I don't think that Avatar particularly was well-suited to the IMAX screen. It wasn't designed for IMAX. He right. said that his preference as a special effects supervisor, and he just came back from a year at WIDA in New Zealand. I mean, this yeah. guy was there on the ground three years or four years with Jim Cameron working on this. He said, my preference is Dolby. But we'll find out what the differences are because that's right. I'm very right. curious about that. 
it the the quality of the Dolby is outstanding, but as we go through it, you'll see there's a drawback that gives uh -huh. Real D an advantage for the theater owner. All right. Well, let me go to go to meeting, and uh, you want to set us up while I get those slides ready. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, what we're uh, what triggered all this with me was I went to see Avatar, and uh, I saw it in Real D. I could have seen it in IMAX. Uh, but I wanted to see Real D. I have seen 3D movies at IMAX uh, numerous times, and I had not seen a movie in Real D, so I wanted to see Real D. And uh, I still haven't seen one in Dolby, but I have researched that uh, quite thoroughly. And uh, another little preference, uh, this is a subject near and dear to my heart, because while I was at university, I worked at night as a projectionist. Huh. Uh, back in the good old days when uh, before xenon lamps and before the, the typical roll of film that you loaded into the projector and you had two projectors uh, was only 20 minutes long. And you had to trim the carbon arcs and rewind the oh, previous trim roll Trim the of carbon film. arcs? That's like, uh, that's like, <laughs> that's like, were you using kerosene? What? <laughs> No, no, they were they were high amperage carbon arcs. Uh, I uh, worked at a drive-in theater, and so they were really big arc they had boxes. To be bright. That, yeah, uh, and they were water cooled. And one night in the middle of the movie, one of my circulation pumps went out, and uh, so the uh, manager of the theater came in, and uh, one of us, I kept the movie going, and he ma changed the pump in in mid. Uh, stripe but no, uh, they don't use carbon arcs anymore do they no it's almost all xenon lamps now and by the way this is something that has really had a big effect on the projectionist union um you know again when i was doing this as at the university now i was in a university town it was totally non-union because there was a surplus of university students that would do this work but in the big cities, uh, it's a highly unionized job, and you have to practically be born in it, <laughs> into it uh, in the old days because uh, the, the projectionist was busy all the time. Oh, interesting. Uh, huh. I mean, you, you, were, you were working your backside off to keep that show going all the time because you were, you know, you had 20 minutes, and then you did a change. Uh, you know, you've seen those little circular marks up in the upper right-hand corner. Those are called cue marks. And that tells the uh, projectionist uh, when to start the motor on the other projector. And right. then you have a set of shutters that close down on one and lift, you know, open one projector and start the other. And you have to flip a switch that takes the sound from one to the other. Wow. And you do a change from one projector to the other. And the people in the theater never know. <laughs> but all of that is, is history because now the film productions come to the theaters all in one reel oh really so you no longer have yep. to have those dots it's, and it's a continuous loop you don't even rewind it just keeps okay? keeps going yeah and it has a, a a cue thing on it that stops it when it gets oh, to the end and it's cued for the next show so all, they can set a timer to turn the projector on and start it nobody has in to be in words, there at all nobody has to be in the projection booth at all and uh, in our theater here in petaluma is all digital with the yes. DLP, so it, I, I imagine that the cashier is probably pushing the button to start the movie. You know, I mean, there's probably well, no, now, there's probably not even room anymore. From what I understand, there are no projectionists. There are now wow. a theater technician, right, who comes in every time they change the film and sets it up, or sets up the uh, server uh, if it's digital, and then uh, he can put it on a timer. Uh, it could be started with a button from the manager's office, you know, whatever. Wow. But it is uh, completely automated, much to the chagrin of the projectionist and projectionist unions. I have so, your slides ready, my friend. You stalled, I see you that. stalled like it's, a pro. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, what we're going to do, like I said, I want to give credit to Matt Cowan, who gave a talk. I have extracted a f some of his slides and I'm going to use them on the show today because I, I find them very, very interesting. So the first thing, let's go back to the good old days. Uh, you know, I saw my first 3D movie in the 1950s. And the way they did it is they had two projectors and two rolls of film. 
And by the way, we had a shaft that went between the two projectors to keep them synchronized. In other words, wow. they were mechanically locked. Wow. And you had to, uh, and you had giant magazines that would hold about an hour of film instead of 20 minutes. And you had to trim the arc with a brand new carbon <laughs> before you started the show because that was, it was limited by how long the carbon would burn and uh, how big a roll of film you could load. But there was always an intermission if the thing ran over an hour because you had to change all this stuff. Wow. And also, if, if the film broke and, uh, and was damaged, you yeah. had to splice in blank, blank, uh, black e film. Equal lengths as well. Equal lengths to keep it synchronized. Jiminy. So, so you could see the problem. Was House of Wax, the Vincent Price movie, was that the first? I'm not sure. It it's was the first one of the I'm early aware of. I remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that was the famous red and green glasses. You always saw those pictures of people in the in the theater with their 3D glasses on, looking right. amazed. Now later they they came out with the uh, linear polarized glasses, and you use polarizing lenses on the two projectors rather than the red and green. And uh, but I remember they were cardboard, and if you t they were sprayed, and if you touched the lens, it ruined it. Oh, One funny. touch, it was all over. Now the other uh, Here, here's the thing. here's the famous uh, image that everybody knows. Yes, of, yes. Of people wearing those silly, silly glasses, and we're back, baby. Fifty years later, we're back. Right. Now let me just show you something. Uh, that what one of the problem was with that early technology. I'm going to use my iPhone, which a lot of people don't know, but it puts out polarized light. Oh, I uh, know all uh, TFT. Uh, uh, LCD panels, the light that's coming out of them is polarized. And here I have a linear polarizer. And if I put it in front of this and I turn it, you can see it. If I get it just right, it blanks out. Yep, it's working. Okay. Yep. So now we see nothing on your screen because you've, t you've, right. t you've turned the filter to yeah. the polarization that blocks so it, the light. It blocks the light. Now... What is that? The, is it, I always think of this as like Venetian blinds, that the light is coming yeah. out in horizontal, let's say, horizontal strips, and right. you've got a lens that has horizontal strips. When they match up, the light comes through fully, but right. when you're uh, rotated 90 degrees, it blocks the light. Right. Now, notice that it's, it's very sensitive to, the, you know, I don't have to rotate it very far before I start seeing light come through it. Right. And if you have glasses that are like that in the theater, if you just tilt your head slightly, you start getting crosstalk between the two channels. No, we don't want that. Do you remember that with, yeah. the, with the early 3D? I, uh, no, I never went to see House of Wax. <laughs> I'm sorry. But I believe anyway, you. Later, I'm going to demonstrate circular polarization. But let's carry on here with our slides. And... Uh, he asked the question, is today's 3D any better? And the answer is yes, oh, by so. far. Yeah. Uh, it must be comfortable to watch. No headaches. Because people used to get headaches from uh, the, if the two cameras were just slightly out of vertical alignment, <sighs> your eyes had, had to one go up and one go down. And, that, and the <laughs> muscles in your eyes would give you headaches. Horrible. And, uh, and of course, they did a lot of, uh, uh, of overuse of 3D. And, uh, you know, they say gratuitous in-your-face 3D. And I'm going to talk about that later. And uh, it requires that you craft the story uh, to use the 3D intelligently. Um, now, we're going to go back and pick up on the science of stereoscopic basics here. I want to point out that what we're talking about here is we're talking about your eyes turning in, inward, and outward for to do binocular vision. In other words, when you have something moved up close to your face, your eyes tend to cross in order to focus on that object. Now, there is an additional thing that's happening that a lot of people aren't aware of. As something comes near your face, your eyes tend to converge on it, but simultaneously with that, your eyes will, you know, as they turn in to focus on that close object, the muscles in your eyes, if you're young, <laughs> will uh, focus your eyes on something close. 
So there's two things happening. Your eye muscles are, are turning in, all right, and focusing on something close. So if you have at a 3D theater something come out of the screen and look like it's a foot from your nose, but you're still focused on the screen to get a clear image, that isn't natural. And that's why the gimmicky 3D that comes out at you, some people, it goes out of focus for them. Be because their eyes, when they're caused to, to turn in like that, simultaneously will focus on something close, and the image is still on the screen. Right. There's two images. Right. And so the distance is wrong for the parallax. That's I think that's what happens to me. I don't like, yeah. the, I don't like what happens. And that sometimes gives people a headache yeah. as well. Yeah. So having it come out of the screen, and, and again, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But uh, there are limits to the comfort when they, you know, make that stuff That's jump out. That's why I it. hate those those effects. I really bugs me. Besides yeah. the fact that aesthetically, I think it just takes you out of the movie. It distracts you. Right, right. It distracts. It's a special effect. Way, it's an you, amusement park I don't, ride. You, you noticed in Avatar, uh, but in Avatar, the majority of the depth was behind the screen. Right. Well, Did you notice that? Yeah, there, there were was, people wandering in front of me. There were snowflakes falling in my lap. Yeah. Jim Cameron said there were three specific moments in the movie where he actually did a 3D effect. He right. said, I only did three. It's three to But, many, but he's talking me. about stuff coming out. Coming at you like a spear. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, and by the way, most of the things that were coming out of the screen were very small and incidental to right. the main action. Except that. Like the snowflakes. Like the snowflakes. Stuff. They become yeah. foreground by virtue of the fact that you go, whoa, there's a snowflake. And you're definitely yeah. not paying any attention to the movie. I, well, I would have preferred to see Avatar in 2D. You can tell by now. Right. I, I, I can tell that. <laughs> so, uh, also, uh, the, uh, now here, let's go through these diagrams. What we have on this diagram is if the images on the screen for right and left eye. I like those eyes, are by the way. Those exactly. Are, <laughs> I'm sorry? Very big eyes. <laughs> yeah. Don't you love those? Yeah. If that image is exactly the same place on the screen, it will appear to be at the screen for you. Right. All right? Now, if, on the other hand, we actually cross the images, it will appear to come out of the screen, as shown in this diagram. Okay? And, uh, and that you know, is equivalent to something being shoved right up in your face. And then if we move the objects apart in the other direction on the screen, it appears to be behind the screen. And most of the depth in Avatar was behind the screen. I took note of that as I was watching it. And to me, that's much more natural. Okay, uh, the other thing uh, that has problems is... These systems, the new digital systems, rather than two projectors, do it all with one projector, and they give you the frame sequentially. They give you a frame for your left eye, and then a frame for your right eye, and a frame for your left eye. And so the motion, when there's motion, your left and right eye aren't getting the same information. And if you do that at the normal 24 frames per second, it's very disturbing. Okay, you can see it jumping. You know, you're, you go left, right, left, right, left, right, and it drives you batty. So what they do, and let me, again, let me digress and back up the truck. Let me ask you a question. What were conventional, how many frames per second were in a conventional movie? 24. 24. Can the eye see flashing at 24 flashes per second? I would say yes. It can. Yeah. And so people say, well, wait a minute. I, I've seen hundreds of movies, and I never noticed a lot of flashing. They have a shutter in the projector that flashes each frame twice. So the flash rate is 48 frames per second, or 48 flashes per second. Because if it's any slower than that, you can see it. Right. Okay. So the frame changes 24 times a second, but the frame is flashed onto the screen 48 times a second. Now... So what they did when they went to digital projectors in 3D is they started out using, let me go to the next slide here. They started out using double flash. And so the projector, the digital projector, had to be capable of sending 96 different frames per second. 
And it did it in the following order. It sent the left frame of frame number one, then the right frame of frame number one. Then it repeated left one, right one. Then, after showing all four of those, it then moved to the next frame in the picture. So it double flashed each left and right channel times 24 times per second. So you ended up with 96 frames per second. In other words, the digital projector had to be able to change images 96 times per second. You follow me there? Yep. Yep. All right. To get smoother motion with 3D, they went to what's called triple flash. And now they send left one, right one, left one, right one, left one, right one, three times. And then they go, you know, left two, right two, left two, right two. But that requires a digital projector that can change the frames 144 times per second. So it's 24 uh, times three times two channels. So they're using triple flashing in this digital uh, projection method. Now, here's a really interesting thing that I hadn't really thought about. And remember, this is a chief scientist for Real D putting up this presentation. And he points out that an image at infinity uh, appears with a 65 millimeter offset. Now, that's the <laughs> distance between your eyes. Okay. All right. That's the, that's the actual distance between your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. R yeah. Average, of course. Yeah. Average. The offset in the master means that a 65 millimeter offset for a 30 foot screen becomes five inches offset on a 60 foot screen. Parallax does not scale with screen size. Oh, that's interesting. All right. So the difference in parallax for a TV screen is not optimal for the difference in parallax on a theater screen. See, on, uh, are you with me? What, what I'm saying yeah, here, the distance yeah. between your eyes, the viewer doesn't change. No, of course Whether not. you're looking at a movie right. theater right. or whether you're looking at a TV screen. Right. But if you want the same dimensional feeling. You have to allow for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he says in practice, uh, an offset for a 12 meter screen uh, distance uh, seems to be a good compromise for large and small screens. In other words, you can get by without remastering the thing for the two. But if you really want the very best quality, that's what you need to do. And, and that's an aspect of it I hadn't really thought about. But it makes complete sense when you go through the steps. Now, here's one that, I again, I, I, I knew that old projectors, I'm talking about film projectors, they have a jitter, a vertical jitter. And that vertical jitter if you have two projectors and they're not, and the jitter isn't exactly the same, uh, will cause vertical parallax where your eyes then, <laughs> one needs to be shifting up and down slightly to, to merge the image in your brain. That's nice. <laughs> and, that wouldn't and happen it, in a digital projection, though. No. Only in a no, physical a, projection. That's right. Yeah. Now, one of the things I've always gotten, I'm going to digress a moment. One of the things that, that's always, frankly, annoyed the heck out of me as an engineer is you, for Final Cut Pro, and I do video editing and I have Final Cut Pro, and you can buy a, a, a set of modules that put all of the faults of a movie system into your video. You can add grain. You can add vertical jitter. You can shoot at 24 frames a second instead of 30. So it looks like a movie. Uh, now, what I find really funny is the IMAX people went to great lengths. They don't have that jitter. In the, their mechanism is entirely different than a conventional projector. Hmm. Um, when I, at Expo 86 here in Vancouver, the World's Fair, they had show scan projectors that, would, that went at, I can't remember... 50 frames per second or something, uh, and or CinemaScope and 3D and everything. But all I'm saying is the per engineers who build projectors have been trying to get rid of this, but you can go out and buy a filter for Final Cut Pro to put all this, in my opinion, crap back in. <laughs> but for some people, it's very important, you know, mm -hmm. that it looks like a movie. Okay, so that was vertical parallax. 
Now, let's go through the kinds of theater systems that are out there. Uh, the first one, and by the way, IMAX is this first one. IMAX uses a, it, it's a double projector. It has two separate lenses, two separate light, lighthouses. It's built into one case. But if you go and look at an IMAX 3D projector, it has two lenses coming out of it. It, you, it has pol, uh, linear polarizers on the front of it, and it uses linear polarized lenses. And so once again, if you tilt your head, you start to get crosstalk. I've sat in the IMAX theater, and of course, tried that because I, you know, but it requires that you sit with your head, you know, absolutely vertical if you want maximum separation uh, in the left and right channel. You, you do see occasionally people complain about, and I, I don't know if it's just IMAX or uh, other technologies, ghosting. I think real 3D has some ghosting images, and I guess that's why. Your, your head's not exactly upright. Right. If you, don't, if you turn your head slightly, you get ghosting instantly. Well, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's one of the drawbacks. But now, I want to be fair here. If you see uh, a 3D movie in IMAX that's been shot in IMAX, uh, you know, the uh, data rate, if you will, the fact that the frame area is 10, so 10 times the size of a 35 millimeter uh, print uh, that's shown in a movie house. It's dynamite. You know, it's sharp. It's clear. The color's beautifully sa saturated. So, you know, you win a few, you lose a few. The next system, and it's one that is used with television a lot, uh, uses shuttered glasses. So, uh, and the glasses are synchronized, and you sequentially send out the image, mm -hmm. all right? I think all PC and, gaming systems are shuttered, and I'm, right. many of the TV systems right. are shuttered. And yeah. it lets your left eye look at a frame, and then it cuts it off and lets your right eye look at a frame. Well, well that eliminates, goes, eliminates the issue of keeping your head up right anyway. Yes? Yes, that's correct. You now then can turn your head, and it's fine. Right. But it requires an active pair of glasses that right. I think even... Uh, mass produced run about thirty dollars a pair. Yep, and they need and batteries have, and yeah, batteries and so forth. You have to have an IR synchronization method or mm -hmm. something, and uh, so you know they're they're complicated glasses. The next one is a projector with what they call a Z screen. It's a Z screen in Canada and England, uh, and you can use it with passive glasses that use circular polarization. And then the last method that we're going to look at is a projector. One, pro uh, By the way, the last three are all one projector. Uh, the last one is a projector with a uh, spectral division. And I'm going to go into what they use, very narrow interference filters, and they separate the left and right channel by a spectrum and still maintain full color. I mean, they're using the same basic technique as your old red and blue glasses, but they're using much narrower bands. And I've got diagrams here where we'll go through it. So let me step on, and here's the full diagram. Here is the diagram of the passive two-projector stereo system. And so here you can see that we have uh, uh, a projector with a polarizer in front of it and a second projector with a polarizer, and they're they're aligned to produce an image directly uh, on uh, the screen. And then you have the linear polarized glasses. And that's what IMAX is doing. So there's a diagram of it. So we have a left eye source, which can be film or digital, and a right eye source, film or digital. Now, the next ones are all single projector systems, shutter glasses, real D, and Dolby. Here's the shutter ones. And here you can see uh, you have a high frame rate digital projector and it sends out a sync signal that alternately opens and closes the LCD shutters on the glasses. So that's a diagram of the shutter system. The downside to that, especially for public theaters, is you have to collect the glasses and clean them and so forth. Uh, you can't, uh, and, and by the way, you lose a few pairs of glasses in people's pockets every time a theater empties, no matter what they are. <laughs> you know, pe people... And, but these are cheap because they're pass uh, relatively cheap, right? They're just like sunglasses. Well, no, no, no. These, these are the well, active these are the active ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are expensive. $30 yeah, a pop. That's why they so like you don't the want passive these ones. Going bye -bye, but you, yeah. you have to allow for a certain number. Right. Uh, you know, when you let uh, 
you know, 150, 200 people out of a theater, right. all in a big batch, some of them are not going to drop their glasses in the receptacle. So then let's go to Real D. Uh, Re Real D requires a digital projector that can handle 144 frames per second. And then all you have to add, there's three things you have to add to this, four, sorry. You have to have a server that can serve 144 frames per second. Now, it's actually serving 20, 24 times 2, 48 unique frames, and then they're flashed three times each. So, but you have to have a projector that can handle that kind of change rate. And, uh, but all you do is stick this, uh, this Z screen in front of this ordinary digital projector and you use pol uh, circular polarized lenses uh, and, uh, you know, you can change. Oh, and one other important thing, the screen has to be painted with a special silver paint that does not depolarize the, uh, the light. If you use a flat matte screen, it will take the polarization out of the light, which is what they used in the old days in theaters. So you have to have a server that can serve the image fast enough, a projector that can do 144 frames per second, the Z screen, passive glasses that, by the way, in quantity cost a dollar a pop, so you can much let people better, take them much better, as yeah. souvenirs. Yeah. And uh, they can tilt their heads. And you have to paint your screen with a silver paint. So that's real D. That's the, that's the system they use here in Petaluma. And apparently that's the most common system used in the U.S. It, and you can see why. Yep. Because it, it requires the least modification to the theater, and the glasses are cheap. Yep. And it gives very good quality. Now here's a picture of the Z screen. Uh, in front of the projector, and that's just on an arm that swings in front of your projector. So, so you, you want don't to even change the projector. No, you want to change from 3D to 2D. Swing that out of the way. That's easy. You're, you're done. Yeah. So that's why I say I think this system is going to win mm -hmm. uh, because it's so simple for the theater owner. Okay. Why circular polarization? Because you don't have to worry about head tilt. And now I'm going to do a little demo with my camera. You've got some 3Ds there. I've got some 3D glasses here. And I want to I want to tell you a little bit about what circular polarization is. Because it's quite fascinating to me. I don't know whether you've ever done it. But, you know, I just showed you the experiment with the linear polarizer. And I used uh, my iPhone as a source of polarized light. And I don't know. I used to go in the theater and my wife, you know, would have her linear polarized glasses and I'd have mine and I'd grab hers and grab mine. <laughs> then I'd put them at right angles and show her how it cut off the light, you know. Well, I, I went into the theater and uh, I, you know, pulled up these glasses and I'm going to pull them up here where you can see that white behind them. Yeah, they look like and then sunglasses. I immediately took another pair. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, now if I bring this over here, this is going to blot it out. It didn't, though. Doesn't work. Yeah, well, I it makes it a little darker. Huh. It doesn't work. Well, I, and I thought, that's circular. What's going on here? So I had to do some research. Yeah. Circular polarizers are directional. Right. They only work when the light goes through the the circular polarizer in the correct direction. Because how they're made up is there are two layers. The first layer is an ordinary linear polarizer. The second layer is a quarter wavelength retardation plate. In other words, it's a plate that retards the uh, light by a quarter of a wavelength and changes the phase. So there's a direction involved. So now if I take the two pairs of glasses face on, and I now get over here where this is, is this. Look at this. Here is right over right. You, can you see it getting oh, cut yeah. off? It blocks it off completely. And notice that if I, if I take it over here to this one, which is blocked, it doesn't matter what way I turn yeah. it. It's, it's still blocking blocked. it no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let, me, let me make it a little more vivid for you. Hang on. I'm going to put glasses on you. He's going to put the glasses on us. Okay, everybody. Close your eyes. Oh, okay. Oh, there, oh, okay. He's got them on us. You know, okay. that's one issue that does come up with these is that they block light ever so slightly. So the image in the movie yeah. is not as bright. 
Now you're looking through a circular polarizer, and it has cut down the amount of light by half. All wow, right. That's quite a bit. Okay. Now I'm going to bring up the other pair of glasses here. Whoops. Have to have them the right way. Oh, yeah. Face yeah. to face. Boy, that sure makes a difference. And you see how the one is cut? Zero transmission. And, the one, and there's no, yep. you know, the other one's clear. Yep. And it doesn't matter which way I turn them. You see that? Yeah, yeah. Very clear. I mean, not literally. <laughs> yeah. Very obvious. Very obvious. So that's the beauty of circular polarization. And now these aren't, aren't uh, when, we, when I shoot with a uh, filter, I have polarized filters. They're mostly circular on my camera, right? Yes. That's what yes. I want on my camera, too. You can get linear or circular. But if you, if you don't put the filter on the right way, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Right. It, it, the light has to come through it in a certain way. So I thought that was an interesting, uh, uh, you know, experiment because I immediately, you know, as soon as we got in the theater, I started playing with them. At first, <laughs> I thought, this isn't working, but it, they're directional. You have to have them face to face. Right. Okay, uh, why silver screens? Uh, I've already really explained that. Silver screens, uh, a matte screen will depolarize the light. Also, the silver screen gives a higher reflectivity and doesn't lose so much light. Now, this is the magic and the reason why Real D, I think, is going to win the fight. Um, and this, I'm going to have to do... I, they don't include a diagram of this. I had to do a lot of digging and research to figure out how this system worked. But, but when you find out how it works and how simple it is, it's just amazing. So now I'm going to hand wave here. So uh, switch hand back Hand waving, me. huh? Yeah. Normally, there's this Z screen that's in front of the projector light. And this Z screen can change its polarization from right circular to left circular you know, at 144 frames per second, very, very rapidly. However, as the light comes to the, the polarizer, half of the light goes through polarized, and the other half that's polarized in the other direction is reflected. Right. So that's the problem, is we lose half our light. Right. So you need to then double the lamp strength oh. in the digital projector. Some very bright guy said, wait a minute. I was doing an experiment with polarized light, and you can make right polarized light reverse and become left polarized light. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a very exotic device to do this. What would that be? It's called a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so when I was in the theater, I didn't know what was going on. I, of course, as soon as the thing started, I turned around and looked at the projector. Yeah. And I wanted to see if I could see two channels coming out. Of, and I could. Oh. And they were stacked vertically. And vertically? Yet I could, huh. Yeah. But I could see that there was really only one projector and one lens up there. And, I, and at the time, I couldn't figure out what was going on. It's but I did my mirror. research. Now... Listen to this. Imagine I put the Z plane in front of the projector. Yeah. And imagine I tilt it 45 degrees. I'm going to do it this way. It's easier on my arms. The light is coming here. Yeah. The Z plane. Yeah. Half the light goes through it and out to the screen. The other half gets reflected here up. If I put a mirror up here right. at 45 degrees and aim it out at the screen. Right. You get 100% of the light reversed. I get all the light correctly polarized. Oh, that's so clever. Almost obvious. That's a head isn't slapper. That, that's like, oh. Yeah. So they now have Real DXL. And Real DXL has this additional mirror in it. And, this, and the Z planes at 45 degrees. And now you get a hundred, it's not a hundred percent. There is some loss, but you get twice the light that you would if you only had the Z, the Z plane in front of the projector. So now without changing the light strength, you can take the same digital projector with the same lamp in it and project 2D and 3D movies. Bingo. What theater owner wants to have two light sources and also 
his, his remember these are high powered lamps you know burn lots of kilowatts per hour well with the xl system they burn half as much power so your operating cost goes down oh yeah. so that's a, how about that's that? kind of a brilliant and cheap and simple and wow kind of a, you know v8 idea that's amazing Right. So now do you see why I say I think Real D, Real D, Real D yeah. has an edge here? Not for because, any technical, you know, excellence, but but merely yeah. because it's cheap and easy to implement. So here it is. This system, the Real D, is circular polarization, exactly matched to the Z screen. Disposable souvenir for the glasses are a dollar a pop. You can let everybody take them if they want or throw them in the bucket. Uh, inexpensive and high performance, and the theater owner has to do the minimum to his theater to accommodate 3D, and he can switch from 3D to 2D very, very simply. Now, let's look at the Dolby system, because it is a very good system as far as quality. In a Dolby digital cinema projector, you have a red, green, and a blue channel, so you can reproduce all of the colors by mixing red, green, and blue, and I'm going to do a further show on color science, and we'll dig into how that works in the human eye. But the human eye has very broad red, green, and blue sensors, and the red and green actually overlap considerably, and they overlap with the blue one. So those, those individual bands, the reason you see color is you measure the difference between them because they overlap heavily. So all I'm saying is your sensors in your eyes are quite broadband, but they are... There are three different kinds, red, green, and blue. We'll call them for simplicity. Now, what they do in this projection system is they use very narrow band interference filters. And for the right eye, they, they go to a, a shorter wavelength in the blue. It's still in the blue band the eye can see, but they have a shorter wavelength. In the left eye, they go to just slightly longer. And so they're, they're shifted, they're offset. Do you, you, you with me there? So the yeah. red channel, there's a low blue, a high blue, a, high, a low green, a high green, low red, a high red. And then if you wear glasses that have these very narrow band filters in them, you're, you're, you know, what, the signal for the right eye can't be seen by the left eye. So they separate the channels spectrally. So that's how the Dolby system works. But keep in mind, when you use these very narrow band filters, once again, they take away more than half the light. So you have to use a double the power of your lamp house on your projector. So that's the drawback. Plus, the glasses with the narrow band uh, spectral filters are more expensive than the circular polarized glasses. So here's a, another diagram of the uh, lamp house, and the, they put a filter wheel that spins these red, green, blue filters at high speed huh. ahead of the modulator. And then there's an active polarizer here uh, That's in a lot, front of the lens. A lot like how DLP works, actually. It's interesting. That's right. Yeah. And then here's a, just a picture of the 3D color management server the filter wheel projector, and the uh, narrow band spectral glasses. Now, like I, as I said at the beginning, the, uh, the guy I talked to as a special effects supervisor at Avatar said he, it was his preference, technically, for the way it looked for Dolby 3D. Now, another, another advantage it has is it runs at 48 distinct picture frames oh, per second. okay. Okay, so 144 exposures per second. So now, this got me, reliability of their systems. In Real-D, they, they have 1,200 Real-D systems installed, cumulative running time, more than a million hours. They've had one failure where they lost a show. That's pretty reliable. Yeah. So uh, here's the kind of summary, the operational considerations. I wear single use for the Real-D uh, uh, you can distribute a voluntary recycling thing or they can keep it as a souvenir. Uh, optically perfect eyewear every time, very low maintenance, so forth. Um, that's his presentation. So that, in a nutshell, is the, are the advantages of the different systems. So we've gone through all of the different 
theater projection systems and had a look at how they work. And uh, as do, you do, you have a preference. I would guess it's for IMAX since you have an IMAX theater near you. I, I certainly think the IMAX. Well, IMAX 2D is just so incredible all by itself, and 3D is even better. But uh, but what I think for the typical theater that's you know well, the, I can see why the, a theater would want to use real D. Yeah, yeah a, you know a cine a cineplex over yeah. here. I've got an eleven screen cineplex within three blocks of me, and that's where I went to see this. Right, they can put in this kind of sure. really high quality three D movie system by installing that thing in front of their projector, painting their screen, and handing out glasses. Yeah, I mean it's pretty easy. You know, can you use that new? Polarized screen uh, for two D for two D, yes. So they yeah. They, all all you do is get a brighter picture. So it's good. Yeah, it just improves the efficiency of your theater. Hmm. So there's no negative really. No. Very interesting. I do, I no. have to say I'm not a fan of three D movies, but I guess that's neither here nor there. Right now, let me get into why I think they may not make it in the long run. And this is what I'll wrap up with. And I'm going to start with a question, and you're going to say, what are you talking about? What does this have to do with 3D? Not, not with you, Ray. I'm pretty much used to that. <laughs> Can a person who only has one eye become a pilot? No. Or do you, do you need binocular vision to land an airplane? You need depth perception, and a one-eyed man has... Well, you can I you know as somebody who has monovision, I I could simulate depth perception with minute movements of my head, but I imagine it's not as good as a binocular person's depth perception. You do not use your binocular vision when you, you are acting as a pilot because it's unreliable. There's the things that no, because the things you're looking at are all more than twenty feet from oh, your face. Oh, I should have known that from our discussion. Okay, so if it's so if it's that far out doesn't matter you get all of your depth clues from perspective yeah from uh cultation there's a whole i could go through them all but there's uh you look at the trapezoidal shape of the runway and that tells you whether you're on your glide angle properly uh when you land you look at the far end of the runway and again observe the trapezoid shape that to know sense. where to flare out yeah that makes and sense and you take all your depth cues and and you can get a private pilot's license and only have one eye see i always the only, went for the, went on that thing that you have to have perfect vision to be a uh, astronaut no. i just assumed that <laughs> you had yeah. two eyes <laughs> no so here's here's what i'm getting at now let me tie that discussion back to the 3d if in the normal real world you don't use your binocular vision for anything further than 20 feet away from you, when you're th sitting in a movie theater, most of the time the screen is more than 20 feet from you. So giving you parallax corrected, you know, illusions when your eyes are focused at something more than 20 feet away is not natural. Ah, all right? That's one thing. The, the other thing is if they really wanted to do a movie where your binocular vision is acting entirely naturally, the whole content of the movie would be objects that were really within no more than 10 feet from you and preferably 5 feet. Which, by five the way, most things in a movie are not that close. That's right. Yeah. But if, if you if you shot a movie that was all about a guy working with his hands on his desk, it'd <laughs> be great. It would be very natural. Maybe you know what that's you know I'm I'm going to say that's what bugs me about 3D. It doesn't it never felt right to me. That's that explains it. Yeah. You, in because, Avatar, those way distant trees are in 3D, and the tanks are coming at you, and they're a hundred feet away, but they're in 3D. Right. In a in football the real game, world, in a we see, don't. This is very interesting because we're we, everybody's talking about sports on 3D, but you never are that close to an athletic event, right? Yeah, that you know they said ESPN is going to come out with a 3D cable station. Yeah, and I and I said, well, wait a minute. When I if I'm sitting or even in the camera positions at a football game, nothing is within 20 feet of me. Wow, this is interesting. And so if they make it 3D, it's not going to be natural. Because when I'm at a football game, I don't use my binocular vision. Phony baloney. 
They have to hook it up. And it's not that, it's natural. It's why it always looks that way. It always looks hooked up to me. It, does, it looks like even when James Cameron says we only did three effects, the whole movie feels unnatural. And that's why now I understand. Yeah, because we only use our 3D vision for things that are very close to us. And in those situations, they aren't. So, Which, by the way, explains why a 2D high-res movie image, like a 4K image can complete, co appear completely 3D because you're using those cues, the cues you just talked about, not your binocular vision, to Correct. determine depth of field. That's right. Oh, that's very interesting. I think you've, a light has come on in my head, akin to the light that came on in the guy who thought about the mirror. You've explained <laughs> yeah. all. I thought that would give you a different perspective on the matter. <laughs> the depth of your perception is amazing, Ray. <laughs> no, that makes sense because it never did look real to me. And I always just thought it was, you know, well, it's 3D. It's like they haven't got the technology right. But no, it's not going to look real because it ain't. Well, let, let me just give you one other quick example of how things have changed. I, I knew a doctor who did not have binocular vision. You know, there are a lot of people like I don't. that. I know. Yeah, you're not the only one. Which is ironic because I do see the 3D and I, my sense is my eyes are integrating better than they used to or something like that. Somehow right. got, I'm doing it. But she... She decided she would not go in, would not do a surgery elective, right? Because she didn't have binocular vision, right? Now let me ask you a question: How are most surgeries done today? They, they, they don't open you up anymore. No, arthroscopically. Endoscopically. Yep. And what is the image they're looking at on? It's on a two D television set. <laughs> there you go. So they don't even use their binocular vision right. today to right. do surgery. Right. They get their depth cues and touch cues from those probes and, you know. Well, and, and as I've always said, even though I didn't have binocular vision, I have good depth perception. I can go like this and match the two fingers sure. together beca because you use other cues. You move your head imperceptibly or using other cues. Right. Um, but uh, apparently at past 20 so feet, it doesn't matter anyway, which means the bottom line driving is and Max all that. Maxwell says binocular vision is not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> Oh, I got to I got to wind it up. I got I got to say very thank you, thank you to uh one of our uh, fans. Uh I of course am now appear on iTunes and you can download the show there. And I want to thank uh Bruce 3000 for his very 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 nice comments that he uh put up a review on the program. He was very kind, but he has now given me a new name, Leo. What, what is that? I am the Geek Father. <laughs> not, the, not the Godfather. The Geek Father. I think you are the Geek Father. I think that's so, right. So, Leo, I have a deal for you. <laughs> Father Geekmas. <laughs> yes, Geek Father. You make me an offer, you'll kind of refuse. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Stay away from the imitations. That would be my only advice, Mr. Geek Father. <laughs> Ray Maxwell. You can catch him, Ray, at twit.tv if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion. He uh, joins us uh, live every uh, Thursday afternoon at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. That's uh, uh, 2,000 hours, I think, UTC at live.twit.tv. And as he said, you can catch it on iTunes. And this show, because it was visual, we will uh, put a YouTube link up at youtube.com slash twit. Look for Maxwell's House 54. I'm sorry, 55. 55, yep. Oomph, oomph. Thank you, Ray. We'll see you next week. Okie doke. What a great Gonna subject. Gonna do some color science next week. Oh, good. That'll be fun. On yeah. Maxwell's House.